Tragic History of the Military Press by John D. Fair, August 29th, <clears throat> 2011. Continued. During the Second World War, national rivalries over weightlifting lay in abeyance. <clears throat> But in its aftermath, the press re-entered the vortex of controversy as a realignment of superpowers featuring the United States and the Soviet Union vied for international supremacy. For Hoffman, America's victory in weightlifting more than any other one thing depicts America's strength in the struggle against communism. <clears throat> in material terms, it was worth more to the continued cause of world peace than the, than the display of force by a fleet of battleships, by a thousand planes, or by a dozen divisions of soldiers. The superiority of the American way of life was validated to a great extent by the surprise victory of six lifters from the United States over a highly touted Russian squad at the first post-World War championships in Paris in 1946. It was a victory Hoffman would forever savor and provided the impetus for a golden age of American weightlifting. The Soviets did not reappear until 1950 when again at Paris, the United States trounced them by a score of 18 to 15. To Ray Van Cleef, this victory carried the potency of an A-bomb in shattering some of the phony propaganda of the USSR as to their claimed supremacy over the decadent democracies. With further American triumphs at Milan in 1951 and Helsinki in 1952, Hoffman could view with satisfaction the performance of his lifters and the state of world weightlifting. <clears throat> One must view changes in press technique with, within this context of need for Cold War superiority on both sides. Although the Americans were victorious in 1946, it was Gregory Novak, who set the lifting world ablaze with the 309 press on his way to winning the light heavy class. This awesome feat gave rise to the myth of the Russian press and the belief that it was the Soviets in general, and Novak in particular, who were responsible for the degeneration of modern pressing standards. Hoffman called Novak's lift the greatest press ever made. Health and strength hailed him as the greatest strongman the world has ever seen. But the so-called Russian press was no more than a variation of the laid-back position perfected by the Americans in the 1930s prior to Soviet membership in the FIH. It was characterized by a very wide hook grip with weight held high on the chest, lungs inflated fully, wrists straight, and lower torso ten tensed. Contrary to earlier versions, the Russian layback took the form of an arch in the upper back rather than a lower back bend, a position held through completion of the lift. Novak and his compatriots were thereby able to utilize some of the more powerful muscles of the chest while, with torso erect, pass the scrutiny of officials. Hoffman even contended that pressing with such a wide grip almost eliminates backbend. Not surprisingly, the Russian press was widely noticed. What was nor so evident at the time was Novak's overall ability. His magnificent press obscured a world record snatch of 287 pounds and a respectable clean and jerk of 342 pounds, which enabled him to outdistance his nearest competitor by 77 pounds in the total. Indeed, the press differential for the remainder of the Russian team relative to the snatch and clean and jerk closely approximated that for lifters from the rest of the world in 1946. Likewise, for 1950, when the Russians re-entered international competition, the accompanying charts which trace the relationship between the press and the quick lifts for medal winners in the middling classes, featherweight through light heavyweight, from 1928 to 1972, provide another perspective. In composite totals, press gains at 6% were significantly higher at Paris in 1946 
than they had been at Vienna in 1938. But respectable gains were also registered in the Snatch 3.8% and the Clean and Jerk 3.64%. From 1946 to 1950, even with the Russian secret out, press figures remained static. While there were gains of 2.05% in the Snatch and 2.49% in the Clean and Jerk. And from 1950 to 1953, when the Russians won their first world championship, the gains were only 4.3%, 2.56%, and 2.29% respectively. Thus, the arguments put forth for a Russian revolution in the press after 1949 seem unfounded. Despite the fact that the press remained the most controversial of the competitive lifts, there was little debate surrounding it from 1946 to 1953, the period of American supremacy. One can search the reports and commentaries of Olympics and world championships in vain for evidence of excessive rule infractions or lax officiating on the press. For lack of any better explanation, one must conclude that lifters, even the Russians, were exercising greater restraints and that officials were interpreting the rules more strictly than during the pre-war era. Indeed, Charles A. Smith, in a series of articles for Muscle Power, speaks admiringly of those who pressed in traditional military style, such as American heavyweight Jim Bradford and Korean featherweight Sung Yip Kim, who pressed 264 pounds on his way to winning a bronze medal at the 1947 World Championships in Philadelphia. An eyewitness told Smith that he saw him press 212, 14 consecutive repetitions in strict military style. And when I saw Kim at Philadelphia, I also saw what an immensely powerful man he was. Further evidence that the press was still viewed as a strength lift and that strict pressers were most admired comes from Harry Johnson. Mr. America for 1959. Prior to 1954, he entered many weightlifting competitions where you couldn't bend at all in the press. Marvin Eater, one of the strongest lifters of the 1950s, was widely esteemed for pressing in strict style. With the lift now at the height of its popularity, Piri Raider observed in lifting news that to most people the two-arm press is weightlifting. They know little of any other type. <clears throat> to most people, pressing is strictly a power lift and even lifters themselves think of it in this manner. Times were changing, however, and the press was being influenced by Cold War politics. The first sign of trouble appeared at the 1952 Olympics, where the Russians were the chief victims. Throughout the competition, the jury of appeal overturned the decisions of officials. In the light heavy class, the Iranian Mohammad Rana Vardi, notorious for his exaggerated backbend, was credited with his 265 pound final press by the Western dominated jury after being turned down thrice by the officials. So infuriated was British referee George Kirkley with the jury that he took off my official armband and flung it on the table in front of them. It was obvious to Kirkley that the jury's decision to reverse the judge's verdict was clearly a political one. Rana Verdi was a potential danger to the Russians and might have kept one of them out of a place. Later, Vorobiev was denied any extra attempts on the clean and jerk on grounds of technicalities through the jury accorded the, though the jury accorded the same privilege to two Americans. Kirkley observed that the jury overruled no less than eight decisions and that the situation at times was so ludicrous that the referees and judges might just as well have been dispensed with and the lifting judged by the jury. He had expected a struggle between America and Russia and some tense situations, but never did I imagine that political bias could override sportsmanship and fair play to such an extent. Hoffman, on the other hand, 
seemed pleased with the results and barely noted any irregularities in his Olympic report. But it was evident to all iron gamers, including Hoffman, that Russia, a nation of 180 million with a nationalized sports program and over 100,000 weightlifters, would soon triumph. With the intensification of the Cold War in Korea, the potential for political conflicts of interest in sports seemed greater than ever. Not unexpectedly, the Russians eclipsed the United States 25-22 at the 1953 World Championships in Stockholm. Kirkley thought the officiating showed some improvement, but he was more convinced than ever of the necessity for obtaining some reasonable degree of uniformity on the press. Despite the fact that the FIHC, formerly FIH, prior to the 1954 World Championships in Vienna, upheld a recommendation from the Referees Commission that referees and judges should be more strict in their interpretation of the rule to permit only upright pressing. The competition was marred by rule infractions and politics. The worst violations occurred among the light heavyweights. Dmitry Ivanov won a gold medal and five valuable team points for Russia. Kirkley reports that in his first attempt with 243 pounds, he got two red lights. The lift was bad with some lean back and the bar stopped. But on appeal from the Russian camp, the jury of appeal allowed the lift. It beats me why. Ivanov then failed twice with 253 pounds. So it can be said that he won a title without doing one good press. It was obvious to Kirkley that no lifter in future should press slowly. Do this and you're asking for trouble. It doesn't matter how you press them, but press them fast and blind the judges with science. It seems that many international judges are influenced by the fact if a weight looks to be pressed easily, he must pass it. Even if there is knee snapping, bounce starts, or excessive lean backs, many lifters at the Vienna meeting got away with murder. Equally concerned was Piri Rader, editor of Iron Man, who realized that almost any lifter utilizing the fast start would still get a little body motion in and it's hard for a judge to know where to draw the line. The rules had been clear about maintaining a vertical position and disallowing any bending of legs since the 1930s, but much depended on how these movements were interpreted and the political dispositions of the officials and juries. Hoffman heightened an awareness of these factors in an article entitled, You Can't Win, that he published just after losing the 1955 World Championships at Munich to the Russians 29-25. After losing three world championships by narrow margins, he was frustrated and feeling the sting of defeat. His explanation for American misfortunes was pro-Soviet political bias amidst the international community. At Stockholm, he claimed that everyone worked to dethrone us as champions. At Vienna and Munich, the crowd was friendlier, but anti-American feeling continued to permeate the officials. Just one red light from a French referee named Pew in the mid-heavyweight class, upheld by the jury, had knocked America out of the chance to regain the team championship. Hoffman contended that on the 303-pound press attempt by American Clyde Emmerich, Russian side judge Shatov shouted, Jerk, don't pass it to Pew and obediently he flashed the red light. Hoffman even implied that this arrangement was fixed. When the jury of appeal upheld the decision, Hoffman argued that its members were too under Soviet influence. The Russian Nazarov and Egyptian Radi were supposedly good friends, and the latter had even made trips to Moscow. FIHC President Bruno Nyberg of Finland our longtime friend has never voted for us in the years of 1953, 54, and 55. Hoffman reasoned that Finland is practically a satellite of Russia, and it is quite natural for a man to favor his next door neighbor. FIHC Secretary Gouliou of France voted with the United States in 1953, but since then went along with the Russians. 
Only American Clarence Johnson voted for us, the other four against in every decision. What enraged Hoffman was their approval of the press of Vorobiev, Emmerich's Russian adversary. He presses with even more of the pressing exaggeration utilized by some of the Russians. As he is about to press, he curves like a spring, bends the shoulders back, lifts with loose knees, then the entire body unleashes itself like a spring when the pressing effort is made. Definitely there is knee action, knee kick, not too far removed from the push presses the Russians practiced so much in training. Vorobiev essayed a 31-pound world record press in this manner and took a 27-pound lead over Emmerich. Whether the situation was as political as Hoffman insists, or the Americans would have won with different officials as moot. But none of his complaints were even noted in Kirkley's reports. Obviously, the shoe was on a different foot than in 1952, and it was pinching. What can be stated with certainty is that press figures in the mid-50s were soaring, surpassing the snatch in 1956 and that these gains were not limited to Russians. In fact, relative percentage gains in the press for this period were less for the Russians than for the United States or the rest of the world. Russian World Championship victories were fueled by relative gains in the snatch and clean and jerk, where a far more profound innovation in sport was influencing the results, rather than improvements in technique. Statistical and empirical evidence suggests that steroids were assisting the Russians in the quick lifts in which, more so than in the press, greater strength was required in the large muscle groups of the legs and back to execute the great pulling and recovery movements. Furthermore, Kirkley argues that the increased press poundages and world records of the Russians were not due to any slackness of education. I know that the officiating standards is not all that it might be, but my experience of the pressing styles of the Russian champions is that, generally, they are quite reasonable. The Russians were certainly no worse than the lifters of other nations. Some of them are decidedly better. Indeed, the strict style of Russian bantamweight Vladimir Stogov not only brought him gold medals and world records, but attracted far more praise than the looser movements of such Americans as Chuck Vinci, Tommy Kono, and Jim George. Still, Hoffman, unfamiliar with steroids and needing to rationalize for American shortcomings, clung to the myth of an international conspiracy that condoned Russian cheating in the press and thereby enabled them to win world titles. As the 1956 Olympics approached, he expressed hope that we will have a jury of sportsmen this year, not politicians. To his surprise and delight, his team not only defeated the Russians by a slim margin, but he witnessed two jury press decisions in America's favor, an event he deemed unique in weightlifting annals. Still, he complained that many of the Russians definitely cheat and get away with murder. This line was carried forward by Harry Pascal, Hoffman's managing editor, who targeted Vorobiev for perfecting a push press that invoked a subtle bending of the knees. It was as phony as a $3 bill. Vorobiev's world record 325 pound press was a jerk instead of a press and should therefore be expunged from the books. If officials would not enforce the rules, let's get a new batch of judges. It shouldn't be hard to find them in any institution for the blind fully equipped with dark glasses, white canes, and seeing eye dogs. Pascal's diatribe was further couched in political terms through his graphic depiction of Bosco, the hope of the free world, locked in a pressing duel where his communist adversary gains an unfair edge by employing the Vorobia style. Yet, there is no evidence that his, that his form of pressing was widely employed by Russian lifters or others in the Eastern Bloc. A more significant development at Melbourne was a rules change whereby a certain degree of backbend was permissible, providing it isn't exaggerated. 
Kirkley scoffed at this well-intentioned move instigated by Jean Dame to acknowledge the slight bending of the trunk that is necessary to press the bar in front of the head. Just what is exaggerated when applied to a back bend in the press? Kirkley queried. Qu- queried. Is it a lean back of 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, or even more? Your guess is as good as mine. Peary Rader shared these concerns, noting that determining excessive backbend would be left entirely to the opinion of the judges and referee. With a new standard in place, press figures soared at the 1957 World Championships in Iran. Contrary to popular belief, it was not so much the Russians as lifters of other nationalities, such as middle heavyweight Firas Pohan of Iran and heavyweight Alberto Pigayani of Italy, who was most tested the tolerance of officials. Vorobiev, on the other hand, seemed sound. On his 320-pound press, Oscar State could not detect any side of the knee kick he has been accused of using. He had quite a little bit of trouble with 325, but it was still worthy of three white lights. Indeed, Vorobiev's victory over two Iranian runner-ups was due largely to superiority in the quick lifts. So liberal were officiating standards at Tehran that the FIHC at the 1958 World Championships in Stockholm decided to get it strict. Its technical committee resolved that presses had to be presses according to the rules. Nevertheless, Hoffman complained about backbending by Russian lifters and officiating calls that favored east over west. It could well be that the officials from the Iron Curtain countries are simply afraid to turn down any lift by a Russian. On the other hand, press gains at Stockholm were much less than in Tehran. Charles Koster noted that 88 presses failed or were disqualified in the four lighter classes although officiating in the heavier classes was more lenient and the new measures caused some consternation, he was convinced they were long overdue. Kirkley, too, seemed satisfied that officiating was stricter at this meeting, and I think the trend will continue. Continue it did. At the 1959 championships in Warsaw, press figures actually dipped. In the bantamweight class, Hoffman pronounced the judging as too strict, If turning down every lift is good officiating, then we had good officiating. And in the middleweights, he even witnessed a Czech official turn down Russian Fedor Bogdanovsky, second attempt press. He was the first man from an Iron Curtain country I ever saw turn down a Russian lift. The new strictness, however, hardly pleased Hoffman, whose team won only one gold medal and finished third behind Poland in team scoring.